I reiterate everything that my husband said a hundredfold. I thank Howard Beach beyond words, every single one of you. And now, look into my eyes, everybody, because I'm going to address. The coward. Whoever you are, whether you're one, whether you're ten, I'm going to just use singular. But I'm here to remind you, in case you don't already know, that now it's the whole entire world against you. The whole entire world knows what a pathetic, puny, weak piece of filth that you are. The whole world knows that. And soon, I know, they're all going to know your face as well. Soon, we're going to have a face to the piece of garbage that you are. And above and beyond you all, you know that my daughter was a force to be reckoned with. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you, you mother, that you will be reckoning with that force not only for the rest of your pathetic life, but for the rest of eternity as you burn in hell. I guarantee you that. My daughter was a big believer of karma. And as you could see, she's magical. The whole world knows she's magical. And I guarantee you, you will pay forever. Thank you. Karina Ann Vitrano was born on July 12th of 1986. She lived in Queens, New York with her parents, Phil and Kathy, and her older sister, Tana. Phil was a retired New York firefighter and was one of the first responders to Ground Zero on 9-11. Kathy was a cancer survivor, and as you'll see in this video, she was also a force to be reckoned with. Karina loved rainbows and butterflies, and she had a very close relationship with her family. She described herself as a thrill seeker and a daydreamer. She grew up in Howard Beach, which is a close-knit, mostly Italian neighborhood in Queens, New York. It's the kind of neighborhood where everyone looks out for each other. Howard Beach is divided into multiple different neighborhoods. Karina lived in the section that's referred to as New Howard by local residents. It has a population of 29,000 people. It's considered an upper-class suburban neighborhood with mostly upscale single-family homes. It's located in the southwestern part of Howard Beach that backs up to Spring Creek Park. One of the more notable residents they had living there once upon a time was John Gotti, the head of the Gambino crime family. His grandson still lived there and was acquaintances with Karina. In fact, after what happened to Karina on August 2nd of 2016, he made a public comment about what happened to her, saying that she was drop dead gorgeous and a sweetheart, and that he personally felt that the neighborhood used to be much safer. Karina lived in a beautiful home on 84th Street. She went to Malloy High School, which was the same high school her father graduated from in 1974. From everything that's been said about her, Karina was extremely vivacious and outgoing. She had a lot of friends, a lot of different interests and ambitions. She was also very intelligent, introspective, and talented. She was a fitness fanatic, a poetry fan, and a writer. She described herself as having a beautiful and chaotic life. Karina had a huge social media following. She frequently posted photos of her travels all over the world. She had taken trips to Europe and to Egypt where she rode camels by the Great Pyramids. 
Her father, Philip, was quoted as saying that she lived more in her short 30 years than most people do in 10 lifetimes. Karina had a blog where she wrote about her thoughts on love, sex, religion, and even death. She was also in a short film based on her writings called The Paradox. This is a demonstration of how beauty can be wasted by a girl with a fascination with innocence, yet runs towards predicaments to put herself in. This is the dissonance of my existence. On July 12th of 2016, Karina turned 30. In true Karina style, she took an amazing trip to the French Riviera with some of her friends. One of the nights she was there, she took a picture of herself at the Promenade d'Anglais just 24 hours before the terrorist attack there that claimed the lives of 85 people. In 2016, at only 30 years old, Karina had her master's in speech pathology and worked with autistic children as a speech therapist. She had a very close relationship with her family and she and her father ran together almost every day. On Tuesday, August 2nd, Phil went to pick Karina up from the train station around 4 p.m. after she got off work. They headed over to a local pizzeria called Gino's where they picked up some pizza to take home. After they got home, Karina hung out with her parents in the kitchen and ate half of a slice before going to her room to change clothes for a run. Phil had recently injured his back and was laid up on the couch. He told Karina that he wasn't up to going on a run that evening and he didn't want her to run alone. Karina had just broken up with her boyfriend two days earlier and wanted to clear her head and go for a jog. She was also training for a marathon in Cuba and didn't want to miss a training run. Phil recalls that he warned her to stay away from the paths near Spring Creek Park. There had recently been some vagrants and some just overall sketchy people hanging out in that area, and the locals had been concerned and complaining. As she set off for her run, she told him, it's okay, daddy, I'll be all right. When Karina left for her run, she was wearing running shorts, a sports bra, and blue and gold New Balance running shoes. She had her phone with her and her earbuds in listening to music. Karina set out on the very short run to Spring Creek Park, which is only about two blocks away from her home. This particular park is a public park along the Jamaica Bay shoreline between Queens and Brooklyn. The park's a mostly undeveloped saltwater marshland with a few trails carved out in the tall brush. The locals refer to this area as the weeds because it's overgrown with grass and brush that can be over 10 feet high. Karina was 4'11". There is street cam footage of Karina on 83rd Street jogging towards the park shortly after leaving her home. This is the last footage of Karina Vetrano alive. It was still daylight at 546 when she reached the corner of 164th and 83rd Street. Normally, Karina would turn right and head east back through the neighborhood. This fateful day, however, she turned left, stepped over the low guardrail into the brush and towards the path. She was relaxing, listening to her music while texting one of her best friends as she made her way back into the thick weeds towards the marshy beach. The desolate dirt path is approximately eight feet wide with almost 12 foot high sturdy weeds creating walls on each side. Karina's text to her friend suddenly stopped. Phil said that after Karina left for her run, he had a really bad feeling. He tried to call her cell phone a few times, but there was no answer. When two hours passed and Karina hadn't returned, he and Kathy began to panic. Kathy Vitrano knew that it was very unusual for Karina to be gone for that length of time. She began repeatedly calling Karina's cell phone. It was also highly unusual that she wasn't answering any of their calls. Phil called one of his neighbors and friends who was an NYPD officer and asked for his help in looking for Karina. Since so much time had passed since she left, they also called her in as a missing person. For the next several hours, Phil and NYPD officers using bloodhounds searched the streets and then the park. Phil anxiously smoked a cigar as he walked in the dark, calling Karina's cell phone and leaving her desperate voicemails. As he walked near the bike path towards the beach, he spotted Karina's phone on the ground. Her screen was lit up as he was calling her over and over. With a sick pit of dread in his stomach, he started running towards an area nearby with tall weeds and cattails. 
As he approached, he could see a section of weeds that was matted down. Karina's body was face down in the clearing. Phil recalls how he found his daughter that horrible evening. She was on her stomach, her right arm under her and her left arm out next to her. Her legs were ironically in a running position. Her head was tilted back and to the side. He started screaming and wailing as he pulled her stiff body up to his chest. Alerted by Phil's cries, officers quickly ran over and gently tried to get Phil to let go of his daughter's body and step back from the crime scene while they waited for CSI to arrive. Karina had been severely beaten with her hands clenched in fists. She was covered in scratches and bruises. One of her fists was still holding a handful of brush from when she desperately was trying to stop her attacker from dragging her back into the weeds. Investigators stated that Karina had fought viciously. Some of her teeth were cracked and some were knocked out. Her running shorts were completely pulled off one leg and halfway down her other thigh. Her sports bra was also pushed up over her chest. There was a visible handprint on her neck. Investigators found one shoe and one earbud that had been thrown about 60 feet away from her body. After Phil left the park, he was met with Kathy standing in their street, waiting for word on Karina. Phil recalled that he didn't even have to say the words to Kathy when he got home. She just knew. They both began sobbing and fell into each other's arms. The following day on Wednesday, August 3rd, Howard Beach was swarming with police and crime scene investigators. The residents of Howard Beach were horrified and outraged at the viciousness of her murder less than a mile from her home. There was also an outrage at the city as there had long been complaints about the overgrown weeds in the park and safety issues that had been repeatedly ignored. As they processed the crime scene, they were able to collect DNA off of the screen of Karina's cell phone, under her fingernails, and on her back. Her autopsy revealed that Karina had died of strangulation. There was a large, extensive abrasion on her right buttock and bruising to her neck and face. She also had scratches on her neck, suggesting that she scratched her own neck, trying to pry her attacker's hands off of her throat to keep him from strangling her. Only a few blocks away, a local man walked into an emergency room with an injured hand. He told the doctor that he injured it when he tripped while jogging. However, the injury was more consistent with landing a punch. Karina's death quickly became national news. Everyone from locals to celebrities to the mayor of New York himself spoke out about Karina's murder. Actor Donnie Wahlberg took to his Instagram to pay tribute to Karina. He wrote, I've met thousands of amazing New Yorkers while filming Blue Bloods. None were as kind as Karina Vetrano. With no DNA matches or tips to go on, investigators asked the public to call in with anything. Mayor Bill de Blasio stated, we really need the public's help on this one. A $10,000 reward was offered for any information on Karina's case. Turn yourself in. I will make sure that reward money goes to the person of your choice, your sister, your brother, your mother. It's a life changer. You will be caught, so take advantage of that. On August 6th, Karina Vetrano's funeral was held at St. Helens Roman Catholic Church. NYPD blocked off the surrounding streets while hundreds of people came to pay their last respects to Karina. The church was so packed that they had to play the service through speakers outside to accommodate everyone. New York City firefighters lined the door as Karina's casket was carried inside. People who were in attendance remember that there were no dry eyes during the service as her friends and family spoke of their favorite memories of Karina. Phil Vetrano recalls that during the funeral, investigators pulled him aside and asked for his DNA. He told them, take whatever you need. If you need my right arm, take my right arm. On August 31st, police released a sketch of a person of interest, a man who had been seen near Spring Creek Park around the time of Karina's attack. A utility worker had seen the man coming out of the weeds and running on a path nearby. Six months went by with no new leads or developments. In December of 2016, the FBI partnered with the NYPD to come up with a profile of the killer. From the DNA that they obtained from the crime scene, investigators determined they were looking for an African-American male. They took voluntary samples of more than 350 black men. Investigators also took samples from Karina's ex-boyfriends, family, and coworkers. 
none were a match. Then in February of 2017, one of the detectives working on the case, Lieutenant John Russo, remembered something. On May 30th, 2016, just two months before Karina's attack, he was off duty and pulling up to his home in Queens when he noticed someone suspicious. He saw a man across the street walking away from him. Despite it being a very muggy, hot New York evening, the man was dressed in long sleeves and a hoodie. He seemed to be slowly walking down the street, looking at each house. Lieutenant Russo followed him for 45 minutes and eventually called the police, but the man was able to slip out of sight. The next day, a local business owner called and reported a suspicious man with a crowbar loitering around the parking lot. When police arrived, they frisked him and detained him for 15 minutes, but eventually let him go. The man was 20-year-old Chanel Lewis from Brooklyn. He had also had several run-ins with the police in Spring Creek Park over the last several years for public urination and other minor offenses. On a hunch, Lieutenant Russo decided they should go talk to him. As they dug deeper into Chanel's past, they claimed that they found a history of Chanel stating that he wanted to hurt women. On January 31st, 2017, police asked Chanel for a voluntary DNA swab. He agreed to give his sample, and during his conversation with investigators, he acknowledged hearing of Karina's murders in the news. A few days later, the DNA came back as a match. Chanel Lewis was arrested on the evening of February 4th. Chanel, anything you have to say? Chanel, why were you hiding out, were you hiding out for six months? Chanel. No, anything you have to say to the family? Uniform! Uniform! and tirelessly and that was because of their passion combined with our passion for our daughter. We would stop at nothing to find the savage that did this to her. When you guys heard that this was, police said it was a chance encounter, that there was no connection between your daughter and this individual. Did that hurt more? Did it? It's kind hurt? of. We kind of knew that. You, we we okay. kind of knew that at this point in time, after six months, you know, and thinking about it logically, it, it was impossible for somebody to find to, to follow her in there. It had to be a random, wrong place at the wrong time, and uh, you know, she was unlucky that day. 
You plan to go to the court hearings and the arraignments? Of course. Yeah. We that, are one hundred percent behind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have to show support. Mm -hmm. The demon must get his justice. Oh yeah. And we will see to it. The morning after Chanel's arrest, police executed a search warrant at his home at 576 Essex Street in Brooklyn. Chanel's cell phone contained 137 search history items that investigators considered relevant to Karina's case. These searches included his online search for the Catholic Sacrament of Penance. He also had searches for after a crime, the price of a second chance, Miranda warning, arraignment, and what happens after a felony conviction. His phone also contained two images of Karina and of the crime scene. The interrogation after Chanel's arrest would become a hotly debated topic that is still discussed online today. Okay, we're present in the 107th police precinct. The date is Sunday, February 5th, 2017, and the time is about 10.33 a.m. My name is Peter McCormick. I'm an assistant DA in and for the county of Queens. Present in the room with me at this time are Detective Barry Brown, ADA Michael Curtis, video technician Joseph Deal, and Chanel Lewis. Okay, Chanel, I'm about to be reading you your rights. After that, if you agree to speak with me, you may, if you wish, make a statement about and answer questions about an incident that occurred on August 2nd, 2016. Even though I've already spoken to someone else, you do not have to talk to us. I'm going to now read you your rights. You have the right to remain silent and refuse to answer questions. Do you understand? Yes. Anything you do say may be used against you in a court of law. Do you understand? Yes. You have the right to consult with an attorney before speaking to me or to the police and to have an attorney present during any questioning now or in the future. Do you understand? Yes. All right. Chanel, why don't we start with, uh, I think it was a Tuesday evening on August 2nd, um, 2016. Do you remember that, that date and that evening? Mm-hmm. All right. And where were you at that time? Mm -hmm. I, was at, I was in Spring Gateway and Spring Creek Mall. Okay, by Gateway and Spring Creek Mall? Uh, Spring Creek Park. Park? Yeah. All right. Were you inside the park? Yeah. Okay. And was anyone with you, or were you by yourself? By myself. All right. About what time did you get to the park? About 5 o'clock. Are there any trails in the park? Mm-hmm. Okay. And were you on a trail, or were you in the grass? On a trail. Okay. What kind of trail is it? Paved or dirt, or what? It's kind of like a dirt. Mm-hmm. Okay. About what time would you say you got to the park that night? That, that evening? About 5. Um, while you were in the park, well, do you remember what you were wearing that day? It was a hoodie, a sweatpants, and a shoes. Okay. Uh, while you were in the park, um, did something happen? Yes. What happened while you were in the park? While in the park, there was this girl jogging, and then I, then I, you know, one thing led to another because we get some other situation. All right. Well. The girl that was jogging, was she by herself or with anybody else? By herself. And when you first saw her, where were you? Were you in the grass or were you on the trail? On the trail. All right. And were you moving or were you, were you standing still? Well, I was moving listening to music. You were, you were walking or jogging? Walking. Walking? And you were walking towards her? I was walking towards her and then that side to side and then okay. one thing led to another. When you first saw her though, were you walking towards her or the same direction as her? When you first saw her? We walked towards each other. Towards each other, okay. And she was jogging, you said? Mm-hmm. All right. Do you know if she had uh, anything on was anything on her head or in her hands, do you remember, as she was approaching you? She might have had a phone. Okay. And where, would her, where was her phone? Was it in her hand or was it clipped to her clothes, do you remember? It was in her hand. Okay. And uh, you said as, as she got next to you, when she got next to you as, you, as she was running and you were walking, what happened then? And then, you know, it was a past situation. I got angry and then started hitting her and stuff like that. Okay. Um, before you did, where did you hit her? Like in the face and like in the mouth. In the face and the mouth. Mm -hmm. Before you hit her, did you grab her or did you just hit her right away? 
and grab her first. Grabbed her? And like, how did you grab her? What part of her body did you did you grab? I started hitting her because of the incident that was going on earlier. Right, uh, but did you did you grab her before you started hitting her, or was the first thing you did was to hit her? What was the first thing you did? I grabbed her. Okay, and how did you grab her? Like this. Okay, with both hands. Mm hmm. Okay. And what part of her body did you grab? Do you remember her shoulders, her waist, her neck? Do you remember? Probably like around here. Okay, around the shoulders. Mm -hmm. And when you grabbed her, what happened then? And then I started hitting her and stuff like that. All right. Now, um, did you hit her with both hands? Probably, yeah. All right. <coughs> and what part of her body did you hit with your hands? Her face? Just the face. Just the face? All right. About how many times did you hit her in the face? Around five. All right. Was she standing when you started to hit her or was she on the ground? She was on the ground. Okay. So did she, when did she fall to the ground? After you grabbed her? All right. Now when she fell to the ground, was she lying in the path or was she off the path? The pathway. When, when, she, when she fell to the ground, and you were hitting her, was she on the pathway or was she off the pathway? She's kind of on the pathway. All right. About how wide is this path, would you say? Like? Well, a couple of feet. Okay. So it's not that wide, right? Mm -hmm. All right. And um, when you were hitting her in the face, was she face up or face down? She was like face up. Face up. Did she say anything at all? Mm. No. Did she scream? <coughs> Her tooth broke. I'm sorry. Her tooth broke. Right. Were you covering her mouth at all? No. Okay. Um, the tooth that broke was it like in the front, the top, or the bottom? Do you remember? No. Okay. <coughs> how long would you say you were hitting her for? About how how long in time? I mean, the whole thing was like about five minutes. Five minutes. All right. And did you do anything else to her besides hit her? Did you put her hands on any other part of her body? No. Okay, well, up around her neck or anything? Yeah, there was. Kind of I'm sorry? Yeah. You put her hands on her neck? Around her neck? Okay. <coughs> Do you remember, was it one hand or both hands? Both. Both? All right. And how long did you have your hands around her neck? No. Okay. Did you squeeze her neck when you had your hands around her neck? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. You don't remember for how long, though? Mm. Okay. Because I was mad at an incident. You were mad about an incident. Okay, we're, we're going to get to that in a little bit, all right? I just want to find out what happened, all right? Um, and was she still moving when you had your hands around her neck? Oh, well, yeah, and then she dropped into the water. Okay. Well, when you had your hands around the neck, was she on the ground or standing up? She was still on the ground. On the ground. Face up or face down? Face up. All right. And then, how did her face go in the water? I uh, was strangling it with near water, and then uh, I put her face in the ground. Okay. You were strangling her, you said? The water, and, and, and you she, put her face? No, she fell in the water. Okay. And then my hand was bleeding, so I went to wash off all the blood. Okay. Which hand do you remember? Uh, you just showed me your right hand, right? Your mm -hmm. right hand? Where was it bleeding? What part of the hand? Your knuckle? Okay. And when her face went in the water, was she face up or face down? Down. Down? Or face up. A face up? Yes. All right. Was the water covering her face? Mm hmm And how long did you hold her under the water? Oh, she didn't hold her under the water. When I came back, she was just... Oh, you didn't hold her under the water? Okay. Was she, uh, was she moving when you put her face in the water? She was not moving. Okay. What do you remember? Was she still moving <coughs> when you had your hands around her neck? At all? Mm -hmm. How was she moving? What was she doing? Like she wasn't really moving that much. Okay. Did she um, try to hit you or <coughs> do it, touch your body at all during this time? Okay. What what, what did she do? Like try to scratch me. Okay. And um, did she scratch you? Where did she scratch you? Uh, my face. 
Okay, would that be on the the um, the right side of your face? Probably uh, one of these two, though. Okay, did she leave a mark or a scratch on your face? Yes. Mm hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Do you know what happened to her phone? She must have lost it when all that. Did you ever grab her phone? Yeah? I might have touched it. Okay. If you touched it, do you know where? Did you put it somewhere? Or? No. No? Um, <clears throat> when you left her in the grass, what were, were her clothes still on? Was no. What, what was the um, st status of her clothing? How was, how was her clothing was arranged? Like pulled off. Pulled off? Yeah. Okay, what was pulled off? Like her clothes. Her shirt, her pants? Her pants. What about her shirt? Sure, I think it was still left intact. Still? May maybe. Okay. And when you say her pants were pulled off, were they totally off or were they half on or half off? What were they? Look like kind of half off. Okay. Um, were they down or up? I mean, her pants. Kind of like down. Okay. What about her underwear? Maybe it was down too. Okay. Now, you said that you did this because you had some anger. Is that right? Mm hmm All right. Um, can you tell me about that anger? Because, you know, I used to live in a different address than I currently live right now. Right. And then there's sometimes there's this man that comes around there. He play like live music and carry a lot of friends around there and then like it because I feel unsafe and comfortable and I like my place private right. and peaceful. And there was someone there who, who got you angry? Do you remember who that was? Mm -hmm. Do you remember who that was? Did that particular person, you don't have to tell us who he is, but did he, did he make you angry that day, on August 2nd, that Tuesday? Yeah, because like every, every day he keep playing the music and inviting his friends and know we just live in a quiet block. Mm -hmm. We don't like all of these type of stuff. Okay, and about what time was that? Hmm? What time was that that he was playing the music and got you annoyed and got it's you pretty angry? Much, pretty much all day. All right. Is there anything you want to say to us before we wrap this up? Like, where do we go from here? Oh, uh, I don't. I don't know. I don't know. Okay, we'll see. Wait, you did. You did attorney, right? I'm an assistant DA. Yes, yes. And uh, the, the 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 attorney the attorney is um with somewhere else, right? Yeah. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm Later on. Oh, okay. So, All right. So yeah, what's gonna happen from here? Well, we'll see. You know, we'll, we'll see. Okay. Like what's restitution? What program? Yeah. I can't say. According to Chanel's parents, he was a kind and respectful young man. His mother, Vita, was quoted as saying, My son is a friendly, God-fearing man and would not hurt anyone. However, Chanel's school record told a much different story. In 2011, Chanel's high school called police after he got into an argument with a female student. He then ranted to classmates that he hated women and wanted to hurt them with a knife. Chanel transferred schools after that incident and graduated in 2015 from Martin DePore High School, a school comprised of children experiencing emotional and behavioral issues. Chanel's mother, Vita, did recall that upon returning home on the night of August 2nd, he looked disheveled and his clothes were torn. Chanel told his mother that he had been mugged by a group of men, although there was no evidence of such an attack and a police report was never filed. In addition to that, Chanel's father, Richard, admitted that he took him to the hospital on August 3rd for an injury to his hand and scratches all over his arms. Hospital records confirmed this as well. Chanel's attorneys argued that the evidence against him should be inadmissible since they were all the direct fruit of an unlawful stop and frisk that was the result of racial profiling. However, in February 2018, a judge ruled that all of the evidence against Chanel Lewis was admissible in court. Chanel Lewis's trial for the murder of Karina Vitrano began on November 5th of 2018. He pled not guilty to all charges. During the trial, Chanel's confession was played for the jury. During his confession, he had told detectives that he injured his hand on Karina's teeth. 
He recalled the horrific and brutal attack as he became enraged when Karina ferociously fought back. He told detectives that after punching Karina five times in the face, he then drug her into the weeds to quote, finish her off. Minutes after his arrest, when he was in the back of the squad car, he also asked detectives if he could have a picture of Karina, to which they responded no. The defense argued that Phil Vitrano tainted the crime scene when he picked Karina up. When the jury went back for deliberations, they requested some key pieces of evidence, the DNA, the autopsy report, and Chanel's confession. However, on November 21st, they returned telling the judge that they were deadlocked. Karina's family was devastated at the news. The retrial took place in March of 2019. During the new trial, the defense raised questions surrounding Chanel's confession. They alleged that Chanel was held for hours overnight without an attorney before he agreed to confess. On the prosecution's end, they told the jury how they had placed Chanel near the crime scene at the time that Karina was killed by geolocation pings from his cell phone. The jury went back for deliberations on April 1st of 2019. This time, it took them less than five hours to come back with a verdict. The jury find the defendant guilty. No! The courtroom broke out in tears and screams and applause when the jury came back with guilty verdicts on all four counts. The four men reading loud and clear that they believe 22-year-old Channel Lewis murdered and sexually abused 30-year-old Karina Vetrano, whose only crime was going for a jog. Her parents leaving court tonight feeling like their prayers have finally been answered. Say it again. Thank you, Jesus. Well, sir, your thoughts? Ju jubilation. Justice. This is what she looked like. An hour before the defendant got his hands on her. And this is what she looked like after. It brought at least one juror to tears, five hours later, guilty on all counts. On April 23rd, Karina's family and friends sat in the courtroom anxiously waiting to finally see justice for Karina. Chanel was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Phil Vitrano has made a small shrine for Karina in the spot where she was killed. He has created a secret garden that only their closest friends and family know about, hidden in a secret spot behind the weeds off of the trail. He claims that the garden of red and yellow flowers helps him deal with the grief and serves to honor Karina. Kathy tries to cope with her anger and sadness by journaling and reading Karina's writings. Both of them say that their grief is too much to bear most days. They keep a shrine in their home and place butterfly wings on her bedroom window. Chanel Lewis has not had an easy go of it in prison. He was originally housed at Rikers Island where he continuously complained about the food and his treatment at the hands of the guards. He was then transferred to a Suffolk County jail where he was assaulted by other inmates and hospitalized for his injuries. There is still widespread speculation online on whether or not Chanel Lewis is guilty of Karina's murder. You will also see if you look this case up, there's plenty of victim blaming that goes on, all kinds of kind of conspiracy theories, and quite frankly, disgusting comments surrounding her murder. Malloy High School has held an annual walkathon each summer in Karina's honor. In the past three years, over $175,000 has been raised for students through the Karina Vetrano Memorial Scholarship. Phil wears his daughter's blue and gold running shoes and says that the day is about running for her since she no longer can and celebrating her life. For live discussions on this case and others, join us for True Crime and Wine Wednesdays each week only on Patreon.